Welcome to Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio. How to survive hidden health care and hospital dangers with author, speaker, and your host, Pat Rulo. Pat has over 20 years experience as a professional public speaker, and for the next hour, she's going to be your health care and hospital survival guide. Each week, you will say, oh, as Pat exposes and explores little-known hospital hazards, delves into the deep waters of dangerous health care practices, picks the brains of her good-looking and influential guests, all guaranteed to keep you and your family safe in today's fragmented health care system. The program is for informational purposes only and is not intended for use as diagnosis or treatment of a health problem or as a substitute for consulting a licensed medical professional. And now your host, Pat Rulo. I can't bear you no more, baby. I got too much pride. But I My name is Joe. Is this Pat Rulo, the host of Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio? Why, yes, it is. Who are you? Who am I? I am you. I am every person who has ever been in a hospital or doctor's office and has received less than acceptable treatment. Who are you? I am you, the person who got an infection during a simple outpatient procedure. Wait, who are you? I am you, the patient whose questions are ignored, who struggles to speak to the doctor as he or she has one foot out the door. I am the missed heart attack, the hospital-acquired infection, the wrong diagnosis, the unanswered call button. Oh, so you're all about me. The show is not about pointing a finger at hospitals, doctors, or nurses. It's not about a political agenda or party preferences. It's about you, your family, your friends, and your loved ones. It's about becoming informed of all the hospital hazards, what they are, how and why they happen, and what you can do about them. This show is about empowerment. It's about doing everything you can to stay safe during any and every healthcare encounter. Speak up and stay alive, Rady. Oh, yes, that's O-H with an exclamation point. Will come. Cause you to say, oh, as each week we delve into little known hospital and healthcare dangers. When you understand why something happens, you are better equipped to do something to change it and prevent it from happening to you. If enough people begin to speak up, together, each of us can alter the current precarious path of today's unsafe healthcare practices. Today, we have some mighty good musings to share with you. And our guest even calls herself the Mighty Mouth. Stay with us to see if you agree. Always a fast-paced, informative, and fun hour, so get ready for a mighty fine time. But now, it's time for the Hospital Hazard of the Week. Nasty Nurses. Oh, yeah, I'm treading on fragile with this one. And perhaps I would never have thought to bring this up, but I had an experience last week that made an impression. So knowing me, I just have to share. Bob and I were in Flagstaff, Arizona, for a meeting and stopped at a pharmacy to pick up some toothpaste that I forgot to bring. And uh, as we walked back towards our car, and mind you, the car has signage on it that has our logo plus the words, Speak Up and Stay Alive, a hospital survival guide on it. We saw a heavy-set, messy-haired gal writing down the website name on the back of her cigarette package. As I approached, she began to posture. Did you ever watch a bird defend its territory? They puff up their feathers and blossom their wings in an attempt to look bigger and scarier. Well, I was already scared, and this posturing just managed to increase my concern. Just as I entered earshot, she barked, What is this? All right, back off, sister. Step away from the car. What is what? I asked politely. What does this mean, speak up and stay alive? Well, as you can read, it says Hospital Survival Guide. I wrote the book and host several radio shows about the subject of health care and hospital safety. And you are... I'm a nurse, and I have been for 20 years. Right now, I'm a night nurse. As she continued her loud monologue... My mind immediately went to this country song by Ray Scott called Those Jeans, specifically the part of the song where he mentions an overnourished night nurse. Oh, I I just have to play a tiny bit for you because now it's stuck in my head. Hit it, Jeremy. I stumbled past the waiting room, just minding my own. And then this overnourished night nurse from out of nowhere comes up to me and she says, Excuse me, sir, but um, how do you get in those Well, 
you get the idea, right? We're all laughing here. Well, anyway, after about six minutes of her ramblings, I attempted to reassure her that I that I'm not a nurse basher, quite the contrary. I really do empathize with nurses and give them all the credit in the world. I don't think I could be a nurse, I told her. I cannot imagine working double shifts, getting little sleep, attending to way too many critically ill patients at the same time, piles of paperwork, the expectation of multiple skill sets. Yes, I am a fan of nurses, but not of nasty nurses. And believe me, during my mom's four months in the hospital, I met my share of nurses with a bad attitude. Yes, we had so many wonderful nurses whom I will never forget and that I could not repay with my gratitude. But guess what? It's the mean and angry ones that stand out. And this demanding and pushy nurse blocking my car door took me right back there. She continued to detain us while compulsively scratching her bare arms for the next 20 minutes, complaining about how the hospital management does not have her back, how the aides expect her to do their work, how patients complain when they ask a question and she doesn't respond because she is on the phone, how her salary is not increased. Then she reached in her car for a match, lit up, and blew more smoke up my nose. In the past, I might have thought to tell this gal, guess what, nurse, it's not the patient's fault that you are upset. Please learn how to compartmentalize, leave your anger and frustration somewhere else, or simply get another job. But now that I am a researcher and voice for all things related to patient safety, I try to look at all angles. And here's a fact that bears some consideration. Hospitals are concerned these days about the patient and family experience. Not only do they get reimbursed by Medicare based on patient satisfaction scores, but heck, it just makes good business sense, especially in today's world of savvy healthcare consumers, to pay attention to how the patients view their overall hospital experience. Wow, there are so many factors that go into cracking that nut. Well, maybe one way to alter the patient experience is to listen to nurses' complaints. Because a complaint always bears a kernel of truth. Maybe, just maybe, a hospital can begin to wrap their arms around the patient experience by addressing the welfare of their frontline people, that being the nurses. From a study titled The Nurse Staffing Strategy that was released this week at the American Organization of Nurse Executives Conference in uh, Denver, 54% of nurses say that they have an excessive workload. 38% found current staffing levels unsatisfactory. 77% said their organization had 12-hour nursing shifts. 96% report feeling tired at the end and the beginning of their shift, and 92% while driving home after work. 56% said their hospitals disregard required rest periods, and on and on and on. Well, it doesn't take a survey or a huge research grant to figure out that when your nurse is handling far too many patients or working a double shift or been mandated to stay over, it's going to cause that person to be angry and tired and therefore more likely to make a mistake at worst or contribute to a negative patient experience at best. Nurses are at the sharp end of the patient experience, if you ask me. They are the ones who deliver the most care to the patient. They are the ones that stand between many medical errors from happening or not. Even the Institute of Medicine says the work environment in which nurses provide care to patients can determine the quality and safety of patient care. It's like any other job. If you feel good about where you work, you do a better job. If you're well cared for and rested, your performance will show it. It's about the hospital culture and climate. And it's not the patient's fault, nor should the patient have to endure the backlash of a nurse's dissatisfaction with his or her job, or worry if a nurse is exhausted, overworked, or understaffed. That simply is not part of the patient experience. Do I have a ready-to-go, out-of-the-box solution to this problem? No, I don't. But I do believe it is a glimmer into what can be done from top level down. And from the patient standpoint, maybe we can be a little more understanding of what it means to be a nurse today. Or maybe petition our hospitals to review their nurse-to-patient ratio. Or seek out hospitals that have acceptable levels of nurses-to-patients. And I mean qualified, credentialed nurses, not nurses' aides. All I know 
is that from my encounter with the nurse blocking my car door with her attitude, it was plain to see that she was not a happy or healthy person, not physically or emotionally. She was ready to attack me just from a sign on my car without even knowing who I am or what I really stand for. Can you imagine her scary posturing when a poor, sad patient rings the call bell for the 10th time to use the bathroom? Let me tell you, the interior of her car was filled with junk. At a glance, I counted seven Snicker bars, three empty Frito bags, two open containers of Red Bull, cigarette packages. Her skin was dry, flaky, itchy. Her hair was unwashed. Her heels were black and crusty, and we didn't even get into her personal life. After listening to her and catching a glimpse at her life, a tale told by the inside of her vehicle, ah, yes, a meaningful metaphor, I fear for her and I fear for her patients. Is her anger and frustration justified? Perhaps. Is she going to take her emotions out on her subordinates or patients? Perhaps. Does she represent all nurses today? No, not at all. But her sisters are out there. I know this from experience. When she finally relieved us of our hostage status, Bob and I got back in the car and looked at each other. Wow, I'd hate to have her as my nurse. Therein lies the problem. Hey, Bob, take the signs off the car. We're going to get hurt. How do you get in those jeans? you looking fine. How do you get in those jeans, baby? <laughs> And with that, let's hear some legal news you can use. Listen as I spend the next two minutes with Pat Schraff, an elder law attorney at Schraff & King, located on Psalm Center Road in Willoughby Hills, Ohio. She always has the answers. Pat, what is a long-term care ombudsman? A long-term care ombudsman is a person who will help to represent the rights of of individuals who are consumers of long-term care, whether that's at home, in an assisted living facility, or in a nursing home. All those who receive services either in their home, in long-term care facilities, in assisted living facilities, need to know that they have an advocate in the long-term care ombudsman. The long-term care ombudsman is there to help them resolve complaints. I think it's interesting to note that 50% or more of people in nursing homes do not have family members to help represent their rights and help to resolve concerns that they have regarding their care. So this is a voice for the people. Where can we find the ombudsman? The local ombudsman, which is located in Cleveland, represents Jaga, Cuyahoga, Lake, Medina, and Lorain counties. The state ombudsman has offices throughout the state of Ohio, though, so there are regional offices for the long-term care ombudsman in Ohio. If our listeners want to find out more about the long-term care ombudsman, where can we go to get additional information? They can receive information at info at ltco.org or by calling the ombudsman at 216-696-2719 or 800-365-3112. And if our listeners need help with that and want to talk with you personally, how can they find out more information about you and Schraff and King? They can reach us at 440-585-1600 or at our website, shraffking.com. Thank you, Pat. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Tired of the same old presentations? Can you forward to slide 38, please? Are you looking for a new, out-of-the-box topic for your next event? Want your group to leave inspired, informed, and satisfied? No PowerPoint presentations and dim lights here. No snoring or snoozing goes on during Pat's presentations. To help your entire group, organization, business, or church stay safe during any healthcare or hospital experience, invite Pat to speak. Her presentation formats vary from 15-minute small talks to 30-minute lunch and learns to one-hour events called The Scoop to full days. Pick a topic from her website or request your own. Visit her website, speakupandstayalive.com, or call Pat to discuss how she can make your next event fun, enlightening, and life-saving. Want testimonials? Go to the bulletin board link at the website for color pictures and comments from real people. Again, it's speakupandstayalive.com or call 440-725-5462. That's 440-725-5462. And now, back to the show. You 
You're listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio. I am your hostess, Pat Rulo, and today's guest is not your average person. She's Casey Quinlan, and she is not your average patient. And in her own words, in 2007, after her 15th mammogram, she won the booby prize. Yep, breast cancer. Casey's approach to her treatment, be an active participant, not a passive consumer. And through it all, she wrote the book, Cancer for Christmas, Making the Most of a Daunting Gift. Casey is a storyteller, speaker, media strategist, and a writer with an extensive background in broadcasting, theater, and stand-up comedy who believes that in business and life, it's all about the story. Let me tell you a bit about Casey. She studied theater and performance at the University of San Francisco, American Conservatory Theater, HB Studios, and the American Comedy Institute. From there, she launched a two-decade career in broadcasting, news, and sports, covering stories for Dateline and Today, presidential campaigns, wars, presidential campaigns that turned into wars, NFL playoff games, Stanley Cup hockey, and the NBA. She did stand-up comedy, performing at Caroline's Gotham Comedy Club, Catch a Rising Star, and the New York Comedy Club, and she is here today. Casey, thank you for being our guest. Welcome to our show. God, if they're listening to all that, I should be tired. (laughs) Hi, it's great to be here. And Casey, that wasn't all of it. Am I correct that you worked for NBC? I served a sentence as a secretary for a short period of time because NBC paid for me to go to NYU film school. Then I ended up becoming part of the road crew for NBC News Worldwide and did that for about no, let's see, about eight or nine years, and then went freelance, and I continued to work for NBC as an engineer and a field producer, but then I worked for the rest of the Alphabet Soup as well. It was in the mid-90s when I realized that I needed to find an outlet, otherwise I was going to go postal at work. Mm-hmm. So I started doing comedy, and that was really more as a an experiment in performance, uh, trying a new kind of performance that I had not done before. And then it turned out that I had mad skills. I have continued to use my comedy chops as a speaker, but I no longer do official stand-up. Although I will say that every time I get to be on a platform speaking to an audience, I can usually make them laugh. In fact, I always make them laugh because if they're laughing, the chance is better that they're actually going to pay attention to me. Absolutely. Humor. You can't have too much humor in, in no matter what you're doing. True. Well, it sounds like then that healthcare was not in your background, but after your cancer diagnosis, you moved in that direction. Is that correct? And then tell us why. Well, well, yes and no, actually, because in my time in the news business, I wasn't strictly assigned to healthcare stories by any means, but being part of the great media machine, particularly when you're at the network level, you end up doing a whole lot of different things and getting to explore a lot of different topics. I think it was in 1989 or 1990, there was a story that I was assigned to that involved the rise of what was then called antibiotic-resistant infection and has now become MRSA and several other things. But there was a, a research study, a scientific study, that revealed that one of the main vectors for the rise of this antibiotic resistant strain set of bacteria was all of the all of the the antibiotics that were in milk so we were doing a story about all the antibiotics in milk and i was more alarmed by why the antibiotics were there that basically dairy cattle were being pumped full of hormones to up milk production and i was horrified and thinking to myself wow i'm really glad i don't drink milk but years later when i was diagnosed with hormone positive breast cancer i had uh, plenty of opportunity to reflect back on that story, which had been however many years prior, many. But I realized, holy macanoli, Batman, I had been eating beef and I hadn't been asking about sourcing. Not as though I'm blaming the dairy industry for my breast cancer at all, but there was that. And then my parents, my mother had a relatively bizarre and rare brain tumor in the late 70s, which was sort of the entire family's introduction to interesting medical outcomes. (laughs) I helped them. I advocated for them through the end of their lives, including end of life. Based on that experience, I kind of was all ready to roll with my own really big diagnosis when it occurred at Christmas in 2007. So I had 
enough life experience under my belt in this area prior to getting my cancer diagnosis that it was kind of a given that I was not going to be a meat puppet patient. So you had a lot of experience that led up to that. And so now your hot topics as far as healthcare is that healthcare is, is a participatory sport number one, and I think price and cost transparency is another hot topic for you. Can you tell us how you feel about those two? Well, as far as the participatory medicine piece goes, there is actually an official group called the Society for Participatory Medicine, and it can be found on the web at participatorymedicine.org. Yes, I know, you have to spell it all out, but it's not that bad. But it's a group of Patients, and by the way, we are all patients, even the most significant of Nobel Prize in Medicine winner guys and gals are all patients, ultimately. It's a group of patients, including doctors and researchers and technology developers and writers like me. We're all working together to figure out what the best way to drive this participatory model in healthcare to a wider adoption because obviously those of us who are in the group are already members of the group and we're working hard on making medicine more participatory, more transparent. And that feeds into the cost thing because as someone who is female, over 50, and has recent cancer diagnosis, I mean, within the last 10 years, I, bing, 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 I'm a winner. I'm one of the uninsured. I had insurance through cancer, but since the end of treatment, I, I have been unable to afford the premium that healthcare insurers want from me as this person who is status, female, over 50, relatively recent cancer. Now, that's changing under the the rollout of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, whatever you want to call it. But I'm a big proponent of whether or not you you have insurance of asking how much is that at times when you you are working with your doctor and figuring out a treatment plan because a lot of healthcare tends to be checklist driven in other words here this is you know once once a happens there's a whole cascade of things that happen afterwards and i stop thinking both patients and doctors stop thinking about what's happening next i just check a bunch of boxes and hand you a piece of paper or send you to do x but i think that Everybody, and this is, you know, again, the participation piece, is everyone engaging and actually asking questions pertinent, not demanding, not diva-like, and no, this is not the spa, but asking questions and and fully participating in that shared decision-making is critical, and that includes asking how much things cost. That's excellent advice. Part of the problem is you ask, because I recently had an occasion to ask about an MRI for my foot, and when I asked, they all looked at me like I was asking some kind of a question from another planet. Well, we don't know, and I never did, I never got an answer to that. So, you know, maybe if enough of us start asking, they're going to have to have the answer. Well, I do believe that there are plenty of us who are asking, and anyone who would like more information about this is welcome to either get in touch with me, uh, and I can point them in several directions. There are a number of organizations from startup companies to larger foundations who are looking at this very issue, this this cost issue. And Uwe Reinhardt, who is an economist at Princeton, and one of my gurus when it comes to health econ- health economics, because that's his specific area of expertise, he was the one who coined the phrase that healthcare pricing is chaos behind a veil of secrecy. <laughs> and I've done a lot of writing and a lot of, a certain amount of speaking, but mostly writing about this very topic. So it's a dense topic. Getting access to the information is not easy, as you just pointed out. However, depending on where you live, there are ways that, that you can find out, and they're pretty simple tools. It's not like you have to have some kind of secret handshake or you got to have a membership or you got to have the special card. You just have to know how to go and look for it. And if you actually, if somebody just wants to go Google healthcare pricing, there's a lot of things that are going to pop up. There's, just, so there's a lot of options, but the, the thing is, if your provider can't answer, then you can talk to your insurance company if you have one, or go out and uh, uh, consult Google, because Google knows all and tells all. Sometimes it tells you random nonsense because you didn't ask right, but if you keep asking, and if you look for people like me, and there's a whole bunch more of me, I'm not the only one, but there's a lot of people out here who know how to find that information. So find one of us and say, hey, 
How did you, how do you find this out? And we'll tell you. Give us your website, if you would. Well, I have two. I have MightyCasey.com, spelled like normal English, M-I-G-H-T-Y-C-A-S-E-Y.com. And I also have Cancer for Christmas, all spelled out, dot com. Either one of those will, in the contact page, will give people a way to get in touch with me, all of my Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. So anybody who wants to get in touch with me, trust me, I'm not hiding. <laughs> Great. Oh, heck, you can even find my phone number on one of those, <laughs> you know, but please don't abuse it. <laughs> All right, listeners, do not abuse Casey's phone number. After the show, though, I will have, as usual, a link posted of the show, and it will have your um, your website address there so my listeners can easily find you. If you are just finding us, you found the best healthcare and hospital survival radio show on the planet, Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio, and I am your hostess, Pat Rulo. Today, we are fortunate enough to have a storyteller, stand-up comedian, writer, public relations guru, and an all-round fun and fierce guest. Casey Quinlan. All right, Casey, since you were a contestant on our Squeak Up and Stay Alive marathon a few weeks ago, you know that we love to play some games around here. So since you're accustomed to improv, we are going to challenge you today with a little game of sorts where you have to answer the next set of questions with a one or two word answer. Are you up for that? Oh, let's try it. (laughs) All righty. Here's our first question. Casey, when you go for a doctor visit, what is on your must ask list. How much is that? All righty. Good talking about cost transparency. Next, if you were going to the hospital, what would you pack? Mm, I would pack my tablet or laptop for the ability to research. All hospitals now have open Wi-Fi, or at least the only ones I go to do. That is an excellent answer. Either you or your advocate should bring something. So when people say those crazy medical jargon words you don't understand, you just... Google them up and find out what they mean, right? Roger. All right. What is your favorite patient safety word? Why? Excellent. You win. All right. Prior to a medical procedure, assuming it's not an emergency, what should come out of our mouth? What should we be saying or asking? Why? (laughs) I knew you were going to say that. Oh, be, channel your three-year-old self talking to your parents. <laughs> Why? <laughs> That's really good. I'm going to use that. All right. What is your greatest patient safety concern? Oh, boy. Well, I'm going to take a two-pronged approach here. Okay. In the hospital, it would be hospital-acquired infection. Me too. If it's just in a regular the doctor's visit setting, it would be with it. Oh, that's and that goes on both sides. That's very listen. good. Listen. The patient needs to listen, and the doctor, and the nurse, and the billing people, and whatever, all need to listen. Everybody needs to listen. And that also, by listening, means you should be talking because you have to give the other side something to listen to. So, all righty. How can we fix our broken healthcare system? By working together. I think that there's been an over-segmentation even within the provider side, the clinician side. If we all work together and recognize that we are all in this together, then I think that there's a lot more that can be accomplished than everybody protecting their turf. So let's stop the turf wars and start working together. Well, absolutely. You were just talking about the Society for Participatory Medicine. There you have it. Yes, yes. Join that. It's only $30 a year. And I will tell you that there are some amazingly smart people in there. And also, if if that's not something that your listeners or any of your listeners are interested in, I would recommend just going to the Society for Participatory Medicine and seeing who the members are and perhaps engaging with us if you have questions. We consider ourselves a resource both for patients and for healthcare to help get this participatory model going so that people can work better together, understand the other side, use terminology that everybody can understand. And, you know, it's only that way that that things are going to get fixed. And then also always and forever and more ask, how much is that? Because it's only by asking that we'll start to get answers. Our last one, after you run in with a life-threatening illness, how do you celebrate life? Oh, every day. I'm just glad to be here. (laughs) You know, uh, I think I should have a tattoo on my forehead. Happy to be here. I could tell by your laugh. (laughs) You know, happy to be here. I'm I'm happy to be here. But then I was kind of happy to be here before. Now I'm, I'm happier to be here. 
Well, we're happy that you're here as well. Oh, I know you mentioned your website address, but once again... MightyKasey.com, M-I-G-H-T-Y-C-A-S-E-Y.com. Yay, and do you have any final words of advice for us today? I cannot emphasize enough that if we each side of the healthcare equation recognizes each other's humanity and acts accordingly, there is nothing we can't do. Well, I agree with you 100%, and I'm, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today. You are energizing, and I encourage our listeners to find you online and connect with you, MightyCasey.com. Thank you, and please come back. I will. Thank you. <laughs> Let's spend the next two minutes with our resident cleaning and infection preventionist, Daryl Hicks, consultant and author of the book, Infection Prevention for Dummies. Daryl, what precautions should we take with immunocompromised patients? Well, immunocompromised patients come in every age. You've got everything from the newborn infants who are brought home from the hospital, and we need to be cautious about uh, who is holding and handling the baby. Do they have cold or flu-like symptoms? If so, then you need to avoid those situations because that tiny infant has not built up the immunities that they need to fight off those common colds. All the way up to uh, someone who has just come home from the hospital from surgery, and uh, they could be in an immune-compromised position, which is means that their immunity system is low. So you need to be aware of that. A lot of the immune compromised patients come from those who are taking chemotherapy and the chemotherapy is wiping out their white blood cells along with a lot of other things, the cancers and what have you. So their white blood cells that normally fight off infections are very low in numbers and so they are in a position where they can get illnesses very easily, colds and flus and such. So just be aware of the patient and what their condition is so that you don't bring in something that they don't need. Excellent information, Daryl. Thank you very much. How can we learn more about you and your book, Infection Prevention for Dummies? My website is DarylHicks.com. That is Daryl, D-A-R-R-E-L-H-I-C-K-S.com. You can find out how to get in touch with me or order the book there. Well, thank you, Daryl. I encourage our listeners to check out your website and your book, and your blog has lots of excellent information. Thank you for being here today. You are listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio. Now you can join us every Saturday morning on two Cleveland stations from 7 to 8 Eastern on AM 1420 WHK and from 9 to 10 Eastern on AM 1220 WHKW and on Sundays in Phoenix, Arizona from 9 to 10 Mountain Time on AM 960 KKNT, The Patriot, or listen to us live online from anywhere in the world at the station's websites. I am your hostess, Pat Rulo. So happy to spend this hour with you to help you survive any healthcare or hospital encounter. Well, if you tuned in last week, you heard my photographer friends, Larry and Alice Abishan from Creative Solutions Photography. They were here to do a photo shoot for me for an upcoming magazine article to be featured in Cleveland Business Connect. Let me give them another shout out. At Creative Solutions Photography, they preserve your memories. So check them out at creativesolutionphotography.com. So since they were in the studio, we asked them to stay and play everyone's favorite new radio game. How about it, Jeremy? Shocking news (laughs) from around the world. And if you missed it, well, the boys are back to try again. All right, here's how it goes. I will read a healthcare-related statement. Bob and Jeremy will use their keen sense of reasoning hmm, to decide if the statement is true, or as we call it, a shock, or is it false, as we call it, a crock. So is the statement a shock? Wow. Or a crock? Oh. We'll All right. find out. We will. You guys ready? I'm ready to be shocked. Let's go, girl. Are you ready to be crocked? Uh, I don't know about that part. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know about the crock part, but shocked, yes. I think I'll shock you. All right, here's the Speak Up and Stay Alive shocking news number one. Animals, 
such as chimpanzees, seek out medicinal herbs to treat their diseases. Is this a shock or is it a crock? I'm going to say shock. Animals are very, very smart. They adapt well. So, yeah, I'm going to say I'm going to say that's a shock. What about you, buddy? It is definitely a shock. If you watch any type of animal, they will do that. They'll try to cure themselves with some kind of remedy. You guys are smart. It is a shock. It's true. Yes. Wow. It now appears that the practice of animal self-medication is a lot more widespread than previously thought, according to a University of Michigan ecologist and his colleagues. When we watch animals foraging for food in nature, we now have to ask, are they visiting the grocery store or are they visiting the pharmacy? One recent study has suggested that house sparrows and finches add high nicotine cigarette butts to their nests to reduce mite infestation. Wow, really? Yeah, I thought that was something. Oh, that's amazing. I can just see the mama bird like, all right, when you go out, get some more cigarettes for the house. And remember, we need a couple of worms here. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what the nutritional value of worms are. Yeah, oh, oh, I, I don't want a protein. Fu- yeah, exactly. Oh. Perhaps the biggest surprise was that fruit flies and butterflies choose their food for their offspring that minimizes the impacts of disease in the next generation. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, I find this kind of sad because that we as humans are not as smart as a fruit fly. Think of all the genetically modified food and other dangerous food items we regularly eat without giving the least bit of thought to future ramifications. Oh, gosh. With that, we're going to go into the shocking news. Number two, a New York couple on their wedding night were surprised to receive a voicemail message from the city's health department informing them that they should get a hepatitis A shot as a result from the ice cream sundaes they were served at the restaurant. Is that a shock or is that a crock? I'm going to say that is definitely a shock. I'm going to agree. Sadly, that's probably a shock. Yes, it is a shock. Wow. It is true. This happened at the Alta restaurant in the West Village in New York. Apparently, a pastry chef who had traveled to Mexico discovered she had hepatitis A after going to a doctor because she wasn't feeling well. Well, it turned out she had contracted the virus during her trip. So the tricky thing about hepatitis A is that people infected with the virus are the most infectious the first two weeks after they actually become ill. So in other words, they can be passing this disease on to people without even knowing that they have it. Hepatitis A, if you don't know, is a contagious liver disease and is usually spread when a person ingests, and here we go again, fecal matter, even in microscopic amounts, after coming into contact with objects, foods, or drinks contaminated by the feces of an infected person. So what does this tell you about the pastry chef? She wasn't washing her hands. Yep. She didn't wash her hands properly after using the bathroom. I don't know about you guys, but I could hardly think about eating out anymore. Yeah, and oh, what a way to kill the mood on your wedding night. Oh, <laughs> I was going to say, I don't think that's what they had in mind yeah. for their wedding oh. night, right? No kids in the picture that night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right, guys, the Speak Up and Stay Alive shocking news number three. Botox injections leave people with greater feelings of happiness. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say that is a crock. <laughs> What do you think, Bob? I think it's a crock, too. I don't think there's any happiness to Pope de Botox. Oh, you guys are good. I knew, I thought you were going to say that you thought that was true, that it was a shock. It, well, I was almost like, uh, well, maybe they feel better. I was like, no, wait a second. <laughs> no, that is false. In fact, a study in Wales shows cosmetic injections may actually leave people feeling depressed. People, and this was crazy, people with crow's feet treatment had higher feelings of depression than those who were injected only for frown lines. Really? Yeah, that's kind of weird. What do you think of that? Could you imagine having an injection of something in your face and then looking at it and saying, ooh, that looks bad? Yeah, oh. Well, you know what? I'm thinking maybe they could, they don't feel happy because they can't smile because their face is so frozen. They're like, no, I really am happy. I'm, you can't tell, but I am. They can't, right, yeah. I'm smiling. You can't see that? Actually, if you can't smile, then your brain doesn't know that you're happy. So the expression on our face actually affects the mo- emotions that we feel. So everybody smiles. All listeners out there, I want to hear you smile. <laughs> <laughs> I heard a great big smile. Yay. Speak up and stay alive. Shocking news. Number four, the caveman diet includes lots of barbecue wings, nachos, and beer. <laughs> I'm going to have to say that's probably a shock. I'm going to say that's a crock. Oh, it is a crock, Jeremy. Oh, we got I got you, Jeremy. <laughs> Actually, the basic premise of the caveman diet 
is the consumption of foods that would have been available to humans before agriculture. Oh, was, I see. I see. Yeah, was this, you're thinking of like caveman, like just yeah. digging into yeah. the- Wings, <laughs> pizza, burgers. <laughs> That's the new caveman. Yeah, really. We're talking about the old caveman where they ate things such as lean meat, fish, eggs, vegetables, and roots and nuts. There was no agriculture or produce. Nothing like grains or milk or butter, cheese, and sugar and salt and processed oils. This diet is believed to prevent chronic disease such as type 2 diabetes, obesity, and heart disease that are associated with today's diet. However, if you do decide to eat a caveman's diet, it is lacking in calcium, so you might need some type of supplementation. Think you're going to switch diets, Jeremy, from the new caveman to the old caveman? I think I'll do a mixture of both a little (laughs) bit. (laughs) Bob's laughing at you. Oh, all right. The Have s- another chocolate brownie. <laughs> yeah, I know, as oh. my brownie sits next to me, busted. <laughs> it's our fault. Sorry about that. <laughs> all right. The speak up and stay alive. Shocking news number five. A secret report in France reveals 125 women suffered possibly life threatening side effects linked to an acne drug called Diane 35. Is that a shock or is it a crock? Bob, you go first on this. <laughs> I'm going to think that's a sh- uh, shocking news. You think that's true? I think that's true. What do you think, Jim? Just to play the other side of the coin and tie this up, I'm going to go crock. Drum roll. It is a shock. Wow. Oh, Oh. Bob, you're too good. (laughs) You're down too, Jeremy. (laughs) And the shocking thing is, is that this acne drug was prescribed as a contraceptive. I don't know. It even gets stranger over there. French medical authorities made headlines recently over a diabetes drug widely prescribed by doctors as an appetite suppressant. I don't know. Which is believed to have killed at least 500 people. So the head of the French pharmaceutical firm, I guess it's called Servier, I don't know, maker of the drug, is under formal investigation for manslaughter, and the head of France's public health agency has resigned. So what do you guys think the moral of this story is? Just stay away from stuff. Yeah, it's the over-medication of the world. I mean, some of these things are wonderful. They're helping people, but... There's just, you can't just keep taking all these things without, like you say, doing your homework and checking things out. It's called follow the money, and that's what that was. The money was speaking louder than the medication. Absolutely. Mm. And what you just said, Jeremy, question and research every drug before you take it. Remember my STAR approach? Yep. Stop, think, ask, research, and refuse. Mm. Got it, guys. They're smiling at me. I guess they've got it. (laughs) I definitely have it. Jeremy has it. I don't know about Bob. All right, guys. I'm still thinking. (laughs) (laughs) The Speak Up and Stay Alive shocking news number six. Seniors in the South are more apt to be prescribed risky drugs. Is that a shock or is it a crock? I'm going to say it's a shock. What do you think, Jeremy? That one's tough. You know, I have family back east, and they're always talking about, oh, the doctors up here, trust me, they're the best. Those people down there, they don't know. I'm going to go crock. I'm going to go for that. (laughs) All right. Well, actually, it is a shock. Wow. Three up on me now, Bob. (laughs) You lost your pants. It's over. (laughs) It is true. According to a study published in the Journal of General Internal Medicine, people in the South, especially Southeast, are especially vulnerable. More than one-third of seniors are taking drugs that they should avoid. Ten percent are taking two or more. More than 38 percent of Medicare Advantage enrollees in Albany, Georgia, got at least one risky drug, compared to 10 percent in Mason City, Iowa, the area with the lowest rate. The people prescribed risky drugs were most likely to be poor, white, and female. So why are Southerners more likely to be given risky meds? It could be that patients are asking for them, or it could be that doctors there are more apt to stick with old prescribing habits. Hmm. But whatever the reason, it's a marker for poor quality health care. What's the take-home message again? Don't take drugs. Research, research, research. You got it. Take ownership of your health. Make an appointment with your pharmacist or your doctor to review all medications you take. Remember, you've got to squeak up and stay a lot. Oh, that's the wrong game, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Well, thank you guys for playing the only radio game in the world that delivers both a shock and a crock, and it's called... Shocking news Ah! from around the world. Well, Jeremy, I think Bob won the game today. Yeah, he uh, he beat me pretty handily today. And I didn't even know the question. (laughs) Very impressed. (laughs) I know. I'm impressed as well. Thank you, guys. 
Coming up, more of what you've come to expect from America's favorite healthcare and survival radio show. Speak up and stay alive radio. Wow. On this show, we talk about the need for a patient advocate during every healthcare or hospital encounter. But advocacy also includes whom you rely on when it comes to health insurance. And when it comes to your Medicare supplement plans, you must compare. Listen while I spend the next two minutes with Chris Alberta, the Medicare supplement partner with Generation America, as we discuss the importance of choice. Chris, can you tell us how are you and Generation America different when it comes to choosing a Medicare supplement plan? They're doing something, Pat, that is really unique. What they said to us was, how can we offer everybody who's a member of our organization basically a menu? Many people don't know this. Is All these Medicare plans, most of them are exactly the same coverage. The only difference is the price that you pay. We work with probably upwards of about 50 different programs and carriers around the country, which is most of them. And Generation America hooked up with us and said, listen, how can we show our members every single program that's available in their zip code and then really break it down according to age and price so they never end up overpaying. All of the reps that work for us have been licensed and trained in this kind of work, and most of them have worked in the field, Pat, actually at the kitchen table with folks. So they're not just, you know, like a sales bank somewhere. They really care what you get, and we pay them exactly the same either way, which is cool because there's no incentive to ever recommend one product or one company over another. That is great to know. People need choices and they need to feel safe when they make those choices. So how can our listeners find out more and where can they purchase the proper Medicare supplement for themselves? Well, the website, generationamerica.org, is is the main portal. That's the front door, really, for that team. Well, thank you for spending the time to clarify Medicare supplements with us today, Chris. No problem, Pat. Remember, folks, Generation America is on the right side for seniors. For more information or to join, visit generationamerica.org. You are listening to Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio every Saturday morning in Cleveland, Ohio, and every Sunday morning in Phoenix, Arizona. I am Pat Rulo, your hostess and author of the book, Speak Up and Stay Alive, The Patient Advocate Hospital Survival Guide, available at all of our live speaking events or at our website, speakupandstayalive.com. That's where you can also locate radio showtimes, dates, and station information. That's speakupandstayalive.com. Well, today we talked about nurses as I retold my encounter with a somewhat irritated nurse in a parking lot and how that got me to think about the validity of complaints. Perhaps hospitals should listen to these frontline workers as they truly define the patient experience. And our guest, Casey Quinlan, I love her essence. So much information delivered with passion and humor. Be sure to check out her book, Cancer for Christmas, at MightyCasey.com. And we hope you enjoyed our fun game, Shocking News from Around the World. Some weird stuff out there, and we don't want to keep all of that news to ourselves. Now, if you miss some of today's show, you are shocking me. When you join us each week, you may be adding years to your life or to the life of someone you know and love. So set your alarm clocks for Saturday and Sunday mornings and tune in and tell your friends, don't be a radio hog. And if you want to hear the show again, or you want to replay it for yourself or a friend in need, simply go to the radio link at the speakupandstayalive.com website to listen to today's program. You might want to do that anyway, just to help you remember more of today's mighty information. Start your week with an O. Speak Up and Stay Alive Radio. Today, let me take a moment to thank all of our radio sponsors and weekly guest experts. In Cleveland, we have Schraff and King, attorneys for all of your advanced planning needs in Willoughby Hills, Ohio, and Daryl Hicks, consultant and author of the book, Infection Prevention for Dummies. Generation America, the AARP alternative, always on the right side for seniors, and Junction Auto Family, located in beautiful Chardon, Ohio, and in Phoenix, Arizona, Thank you to Mountain View Funeral Home and Cemetery in Mesa and Queen Creek. Power tags, titles, and more also in Queen Creek. Generation America, your resource for quality Medicare supplements and Coyote Coupon Books. 
Well, be sure to listen next week when we have two hospital representatives to tell us how their hospital is including patient and families on their advisory boards to get input from real people and real consumers. I think you'll find it heartening. And of course, the boys will be here to play whatever game they decide. Always a fun way to share important health care and hospital survival tips and tools with you. That's next Saturday morning, where you can find us in Cleveland, Ohio, from 7 to 8 Eastern on AM 1420 WHK. And from 9 to 10 Eastern on AM 1220 WHKW. Or Sunday morning in Phoenix, Arizona, you can listen from 9 to 10 Mountain Time on AM 960 KKNT, The Patriot. Or listen live via the Internet. Check the speakupandstayalive.com website to find out how. In the meantime, I hope you have a happy and a healthy week. I am Pat Rulo, and I am your guide to safe and successful health care and hospital encounters. The information provided in today's broadcast is for informational purposes only and was not intended for use as diagnosis or treatment of a health problem or as a substitute for consulting a licensed medical professional. Generation America supports Speak Up and Stay Alive. Generation America, the smart, conservative, and traditional 50-plus membership organization. Generation America cares what their members think about the issues affecting seniors and ensure their voices are heard. And they provide a full range of benefits to members. For instance, if you're looking for a quality Medicare supplement, their rates are lower than the other 50-plus organization three out of four times. Generation America, on the right side for seniors. To join and to find out more, visit GenerationAmerica.org.